So we go ahead and run our experiment. We have our 10 meter long pipe that has a six centimeter diameter, it's smooth walled, and we match the Reynolds number. We get that velocity up there to a nice high number and we get that 2.8 times 10 to the six Reynolds number. And then we take a pressure measurement. We measure how much pressure that requires and we get this, you know, the PDX2, which we can measure, and we get a value. Call it just C. doesn't matter what it is right now. We're just going to see how we would use that. All right, so that's our C. Now, we need to remember the definition of dimensionless pressure. So dimensionless pressure is P2 over rho 2 U2 squared. So we're trying to see how this C that we measured relates to the actual pressure drop we would see in the large pipe that we're trying to simulate. So we're going to go into the dimensionless land here, uh, which is where the two pipes are identical. And then we're going to see, you know, back out what would happen with the other pipe. So if we do that and we look at the dimensionless pressure, it would be this. It would be the same as dp2 dx2 times d2 over rho2 u2 squared. So, um, so that's when I use my... Uh, my go from my dimension, go to the dimensionless world. I also want to make sure I know what x is. x is x over d2 in this case. So, so I have a, so that d2 comes up here, rho u squared here. Notice we have a rho 2 here because we actually do change, you know, usually we've done incompressible flow, so we only have one density. But of course, we're changing fluids. We're changing from water to air here. So we have to make sure we're aware that in this case, it's not the same density, of course, as in the actual case of the case we're trying to simulate, where we would have air instead of water. So we have all these. Um, that's our, that's how we would relate what we measured, because of course, we're going to measure in real physical space to the dimensionless answer. So this is going to be the dimensionless version of this once you do all this little multiplication. So, uh, and then you could say, all right, well, we measured this C, so that means that the dimensionless one, this is where we actually put in a value for that. We put in C and D2 and rho 2 and U2 squared. So that's our, that's what we end up with as our experimental result put into dimensionless terms. Now we're going to relate that to the dp1 dx. So dp1 dx, which is the pressure measurement we would expect to see, the pressure gradient we expect to see in pipe 1, of course, that's also going to be um, related to the dimensionless one. And, of course, it's going to be related uh, in such a way that we have rho u squared over d1. So we're going to go the other way now. So we have dp1 dx on the left, the dimensionless one here, and then this is rho 1 u1 uh, and d1 because this, of course, is all in now in the one coordinate frame. So that's going to be that, but we now know the value for this because they're geometrically similar. The two results for them um, in the dimensionless space are going to be the same. So we can actually plug in this result into here. So we have that dp, dp1 dx1 is equal to c d2 over rho 2 u2 squared times rho 1 u1 squared divided by d1. So I've just plugged in the experimental result we got for the dimensionless dp dx because the dimensionless dp dx does not change because these are geometrically and dynamically similar flows, which means the dp the dimensionless chain values are going to be identical for the two flows. So we plug in this one for this, and then we end up with a final form for dp1 dx1, which is equal to d2 over d1 times rho 1 u1 squared over rho 2 u2 squared times c. And that is the answer. So if you just simply wanted to uh, get the value for the required pressure gradient to drive the flow in that larger pipe, that's the relationship based on our, on our solution. But we can simplify this and see how the friction factor really plays a role here by taking a look at the definition of the friction factor. So we have dp delta p over ld 2 over rho u bar squared. That's the definition of the friction factor if there is no significant height change. So we're assuming that delta z is zero in this problem as it's been drawn and discussed. So that's our 
our definition of the friction factor. And so we can rewrite that um, as delta P over L is just dP dx. So that's dP dx actually would be negative thing. Let's do it over there. We'll do this. And D and then 2 over rho u bar squared. Okay, so that's our that's our um, friction factor definition. And so we can take that and now apply that to pipe 2, the one that we had experimental results for, dp2 dx2, d2, 2 over rho u2 squared, rho 2 u2 squared. And of course we know that's equal to, this grouping here is just c, because that's what we actually measured, right? So we measured dp2 dx2, so that's our c constant that we measured, times d2 times 2 over rho 2 u2 two squared. So that's f based, based on the measurements that we made with our experiment. If we wanted to find a friction factor, that's what it would be. So now we say, all right, well, how does that relate back to, to 2 to 1? I'm going to rewrite this one more time just to make it look a little clearer. 2c d2 over rho 2 u2 two squared. <coughs> now I'm going to compare that to F1. F1 is dp1 dx1, d1, 2 over rho u1 squared. Same definition, basically. But now <coughs> I'm going to plug in for dp dx1 <coughs> the answer that we found before this answer. So I'll put it down here where you can see it. So I'm going to plug in here is d2 over d1, rho 1 u1 squared over rho 2 u2 squared. That came from our solution of the dimensionless equations, and this is times c. So I'm going to put that into here, because that's what we found. So f1 is equal to d2 over d1, rho 1 u1 squared over rho 2 u2 squared, all times c, all times 2, I'm sorry, d1, divided times 2 over rho 1 u1 squared. So what cancels? This d1 cancels, this rho 1 u1 cancels, u1 squared cancels, and what am I left with? I'm left that f1 is equal to 2 times c times d2 over rho 2 u2 squared. That's interesting because that's exactly what f2 is equal to. That is, the friction factor is the same, and that's the whole point. So if we find the friction factor using pipe 2, that gives us the friction factor for pipe 1. They give exactly the same value. And so that's why this is useful. Because the flows are geometrically and dynamically similar, the friction factor is the same for the two flows, and that's why we use the friction factor. By measuring F2, we also find F1, and that's why when you're, uh, this is the reason why the friction factor, when you're looking it up on the Tamudi diagram, you only need to know two things. You need to know the dynamic similarity, you need to match the Reynolds number, and you need to know the geometric similarity, which is just epsilon over D for a fully developed pipe. So in this case, um, we see that very explicitly, and it's also, you know, you should note also that if this, the, uh, while we did match the D over L value here, you don't have to for the fully developed regime, because we know that it doesn't really change. The friction factor is going to be the same as long as the flow is fully developed. So we actually could have gone with a significantly shorter pipe. We wanted a 10 meter pipe. As long as it was fully developed over most of the region, we have good reason to believe that it could be a shorter pipe and still yield the same exact friction factor. They would be dynamically similar as long as the ge geometric, geomet geometric similarity in the epsilon over D was the same, the Reynolds number were the same, and the flow in the pipe was in fact fully developed.